Welcome to The Soar Podcast, the place for creative entrepreneurs with limitless dreams and unconventional stories who want to build healthier, happier, more profitable self-employed businesses. I'm your host, Ray Hyde Cornell. Get ready to soar. Welcome to the SOAR podcast. On today's episode, we have Patty Handy. Patty, tell our listeners what it is that you do. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate you having me. This is going to be a great conversation. So I am a financial coach, um, actually uh, resigned recently as a financial advisor and a prior mortgage advisor as well, but I pivoted to financial coaching and I work specifically with divorced, widowed, and single women. Um, found that a lot of those uh, ladies were um, in, in, in need of some financial uh, confidence and some, um, life coaching along with a very critical time in their life where they're kind of pivoting to a new chapter. And so I really just love working with that, with that world. Yeah. It's a whole new experience going from sharing money decisions and making money decisions mm -hmm. as kind of like a collective household to making them for yourself and not having anybody to give you input or advice, or maybe somebody else making those decisions for you. And now you have right. the freedom to really shape the direction of your finances. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that um, if the husbands, which is more, more common than not, if the husbands took care of the finances and um, suddenly the husband passed away or a divorce and suddenly they're all alone and it's up to them to kind of run the ship. It's very overwhelming. There's a lot of fear, um, a lot of um, just embarrassment. And I want to just get rid of that language completely and empower and, and uh, you know, get these ladies uh, feeling secure and, and stable and, uh, you know, looking forward to the new chapter. It's interesting that you say embarrassment, that that mm -hmm. wasn't something, I mean, fear, absolutely, uncertainty, uh, lots of questions, kind of like lack of um, financial literacy, you know, but embarrassment, that one kind of surprised me. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I was an advisor, I would have ladies come in um, and I've talked to some ladies, you know, since then who feel like they should be um, more aware and a more um, on their game, so to speak, with investing specifically. And they just don't want to ask the questions because they feel embarrassed. I mean, I've had some ladies in tears about, gosh, I just, I should know this and I don't. And I just, I don't even know where to start. And I'm just so embarrassed with this. And I'm like, no, no, there's no shame. There's no embarrassment. There's, you know, we weren't taught this at home. We weren't taught this in school. And, you know, unless you have this formal education, it's, of course, you're not going to have this. Um, so um, I, I just, again, I want to get rid of that language and I want to get rid of those, those feelings. And that's a, a big ask, but um, you know, I honor what they're feeling, but I also try to let them see that this is a time of grace and it's a time of just really um, stepping into your greatness by learning, you know, yeah. it's, it's now a new chapter and now it's time to move forward. Especially with something like investing to me, that seems like that's kind of a, a top layer, top level kind of um, financial activity where first you start with managing your checking account, just what's coming in and what's going out. And right, then you right. kind of graduate to, okay, maybe I should have some savings accounts. And then once you've kind of got that situated, then you start thinking about investing. I mean, I know I even do the uh, financial management for our household and I don't even have the headspace for things like investing, which is why we work with a financial advisor. So, I mean, that is something that I think a lot of women, they put a lot of pressure on themselves to mm -hmm. be smart in all areas of your life. But I mean, that, especially right. the investing part takes up so much mental energy to figure out. And I don't think that's something that a lot of people have figured out. Right. I, I, I agree. And even if you're working with an advisor, which I definitely, um, I, my services complement an advisor. I don't do um, investing anymore. I don't do uh, advice. I don't do managing money. I don't, I don't, I don't hold monies. Mm -hmm. um, so uh but going into that meeting with a financial advisor, if you have an understanding of the conversation, of the topics they're talking about, if they're discussing tax strategies, if they're talking about different you know, investment portfolio models and what does that mean, mm -hmm. um, it just empowers you and makes you feel more confident and it makes you more comfortable in asking those questions. And I always encourage ladies, I'm like, if something is being said to you and you don't understand it, be okay with saying, you know what, I'm not sure I got what you said. Can you please say it again differently? So I understand it completely because there's a lot of 
you know, lingo and jargon that's used in that in that world and a lot of moving parts of different products. So I obviously, you know, definitely encourage those to feel comfortable and saying, I don't get it, say it again. Absolutely. And to echo your point, make sure that you're working with someone who has the patience and the the willingness to explain those things to you. Because I know when my husband and I were shopping for a financial advisor, there are some who it's like, if you don't get it the first time they say something, they kind of roll their eyes and they go, oh, like now I have to really re explain things. And so we ended up finding a tax professional and a financial advisor who they enjoy teaching. And when I go, John, I just don't have a head for taxes. Can you like, give me an analogy, something that I can wrap my brain around. He goes, okay, cool. I got you. And he'll explain it in a way that makes sense to me. And so I don't think awesome. that's such a heavy ask for women to seek out someone who's actually willing to work with them, knowing that financial literacy is not their basically first language. Right, right. I, I love that you found someone like that. And that is the ultimate um, find when you find somebody who was willing to, you know, explain things, you know, again and again, if necessary, and then has the patience and the desire to educate. That's, that's fantastic. So good for you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's not easy too. So be patient yeah. with yourself. And so in addition to, you know, not putting so much pressure on yourself or letting yourself succumb to embarrassment of not knowing everything there is to know about investing. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see women making with their finances from either those kind of like um, more entry level levels of managing your income and your outcome all the way up to investing? Right. So some of the common things, especially like post-divorce, um, I find a lot of ladies who are you know, they're coming out of an emotional traumatic mm. experience. There's a lot of, you know, hurt and angst and, and trying to find yourself again. A lot of times, I mean, I know in my marriage, I got lost in the marriage. And when I was, you know, after my divorce, um, I was rediscovering myself. And, and part of that is, um, and my son at the time was 18 months old. So I did a lot of emotional spending. I, I wanted to, you know, take care of him and, and spoil him because, you know, now dad was out of the picture full time. And, um, you know, that's not good. <laughs> Emotional spending is not good. And of course, you know, spoiling your kid is not good. And that didn't last long. I, 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 you know, became aware of what I was doing, but, um, a lot of emotional spending happens. So what happens is there's a lot more debt and there's a lot more issues with, okay, now I'm in this situation where I've got all this credit card debt and I don't even know how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is just, you know, unwinding and unpacking some of those, some of those situations and, and peeling back the onion layers, so to speak, with regards to what's happening, you know, and why um, getting to the root of the money story, getting to the root of, you know, their, their issues and so that they can then become um, more healthier with those financial choices and those habits and realizing that setting themselves up for uh, a peaceful retirement and a comfortable you know, lifestyle is the ultimate goal. And if there's kids involved, you know what that looks like. Um, so that's one of the things, you know, there's a lot of emotional issues behind um, their spending. And again, that's really a lot of post-divorce. Um, and then the other thing is really not having an understanding of where they're at financially. So it's like there's... Um, a lack of understanding with what's coming in and what's going out. I, I don't know how much my, you know, it, it costs to run my household. I don't have a real good handle on my budget. And that's especially if, again, the husband sort of took care of everything. Um, and then the assets. Okay, I've got this much in assets and this much in liabilities. What does my net worth look like? What am I, what am I starting out with? What does, you know, my, my, my foundation begin with? So I always start with, let's get a handle on, on where we are today, where we want to go, you know, by when, and then make a plan to get to, you know, what has to, you know, the steps we take to get to that place, that roadmap, if you will. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is, is, is a common, you know, conversation. So, um, and that's as, as basic as that sounds, that really is a great fundamental foundation because they now feel empowered because they know what's going on. They have that confidence of like, okay, I got a handle on what's coming in and what's going out. I've got a handle on where my holes are in my boat. And if I don't plug the holes, I'm going to sink. So let's stop that emotional spending. Um, so those are some of the fundamental, you know, starting points. I like that you mentioned a money story because yeah. we often look at money and we, we 
think to your point that it should be very clinical and cut and dry and pluses and minuses and black and red and, and all of that. And it's not, it's much right. more emotional, intellectual, relational than we give it credit for. So mm -hmm. when you're working with someone as a financial coach on untangling their financial or uh, money story, I should say, how far back do you go? Well, our money story starts at birth. And from birth to age eight, we are a sponge. Our mind is a sponge and we're taking in everything that we hear. So if we're hearing our parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, coaches, whoever speaking, and we're hearing this certain you know, language, whether it's a scarcity, lack language or a language of abundance, that's our reality. That's our truth. We're too young at you know two, three, four years old to say, you know, that doesn't make any sense, mom, or or I don't have a filter, you know, to, to, to process that I just take it in as truth, and my reality. So that's the tape recorder that's happening in our in our, in our, you know, little our, our mind. So um, understanding our money story, our relationship is sort of going back into our childhood and looking at what is it that we heard? What was the stories that we heard? Did we hear the typical money doesn't grow on trees and rich people are greedy. I mean, we hear that as a very common, right? Or did we hear that, you know, there's opportunities everywhere and there's possibilities everywhere and whatever it is that you want in life, you can, you, you can, you know, absolutely achieve it. And, you know, that's an abundance mindset. So we get to that root. Um, and I'm sure you've heard this stat, the number of people who won the lottery, um, you know, like 75% mm -hmm. of them are back to where they were, you know, a year later, because that isn't their reality. That's not their, 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 uh, set point, if you will. Yeah. So their mindset is in that lack scarcity. So subconsciously they just, you know, go through it. Um, so we really go deep into their, their story and we, we, we unlearn some of those, you know, stories and we poke holes in them. Um, and then we reprogram. And it takes time. You know, we've been programmed a certain way for decades, right? So it isn't like we're going to think new thoughts and suddenly life will be great. It's going to be a lot of unwinding and a lot of retraining that subconscious mind. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you say that because I think of, there's a woman who she's a business coach um, who I've listened to for years and I, I really admire. Uh, her name is Katrina Ruth. And she talks openly about how when she was really hitting these strides in her business and she was bringing in $40,000 a month, it was just going away. And she was like, this doesn't make any sense. How is this possible? Mm. I'm a broke rich person, basically. How is that possible? And she realized it's her mindset. It's her mentality of she, she had these seeds of doubt around, oh, I'm always going to have to struggle or mm. money is always going to be hard to come by, or there's no way that I can ever have a stable, reliable financial uh, situation given what I do for a living, which she started out as a personal trainer and eventually went into business coaching and mindset coaching and all of that. And it's that, that's what it is. It's not mm -hmm. the economy. It's not where you're putting your money. It's your mentality that right. seeds all of these things that we tend to blame. Yes, a hundred percent. And that what, what she was referring to was that identity. She identifies mm -hmm. with that person who's always going to be struggling or always going to be broke or always going to be, you know, grinding and hustling. And um, there is, I mean, the awareness of it, just putting a, a, a title to what she's experiencing is the first step. And we're all processing and we're all growing. I mean, I'm still growing and still learning. I'm, I haven't like mastered this, but it's, you know, I think there's nobody in the world that's mastered it. Well, maybe the Dalai Lama, I don't know, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's, you know, we're all growing and we're all, all learning, but if we identify with that, that's what we are going to attract. And that's where law of attraction comes into play. We're not going to sit and go, oh, I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy and suddenly become wealthy. Right. But in the background, if we identify with, oh, I'm broke and I'm going to struggle and I'm going to, you know, then the, the identity is what you attract. So um, it's really an interesting, it's very fascinating and it's, um, it's an ever evolving, uh, you know, conversation. And I think that once people you know, get to it and realize that, that that that's even part of the financial picture for them. It's always a lot of fun to have those conversations because I can teach you the mechanics of money easily. I can teach you what a mutual fund is and I can teach you a tax strategy and I can tell you about Roth conversions and whatever else you want to know about, which is, you know, boring as all get out. But if you don't have the 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 mindset and that identity de de dealing with, you will always be struggling in some capacity, like your yeah. friend you just mentioned. Yeah. And, and it's, really it's a Rubik's cube. It's, you're mm -hmm. not just going to continually put one piece in place and reach this state of perfection. Really, when you put 
one or two pieces in place, maybe one other thing emerges as, oh shit, I didn't even know this was a problem. You know, okay, now I've got to tackle this. This is out of place. And then you get that thing in place, but then that reveals another thing that's out of place. And it's this constant commitment to doing better and learning and improving rather than thinking that you have to be perfect, which is where I think a lot of this, these seeds of, you know, shame and embarrassment come into play. Mm -hmm. So I want to dig more into this mindset piece a little bit. We are going to take a super short commercial break and we'll be right back. Hey, Ray here. Let's talk money. Money is universal. It's the conduit for exchanging energy between people and business entities, which are really just more people. It's how we build the lives we want and it's how we can make an impact for the better. As a good friend of mine likes to say, good money in the hands of good people can do good things. And if you don't have a healthy relationship with money, you're inevitably going to run into trouble. Whether you're struggling with your pricing or you're not sure where the money you work so hard for is vanishing off to, or you just want to have an easier time of attracting in money like a magnet, you will find everything you need to transform your money mindset and manifest the wealth you want inside of my course, Money Mindset Mastery. Plus, as an added bonus, you'll also get access to my most popular barrier-busting workshop, Price Yourself Perfectly. Learn more at chironconsulting.us forward slash money mindset. That's all one word, money mindset. Go to chironconsulting.us forward slash money mindset. We are back with Patty Handy. So Patty, you've been telling us about money mindset and this identity piece in particular, and that can be very insidious because we don't often look at our identity. And so sometimes when I'm working with my mentees on the Chiron side, we have to look at the practicalities to really identify the hidden beliefs that we don't know are there. And one of those things in money comes down to budgeting, which is something that you help your clients with. Mm -hmm. But in, in my head, and I, I do very loose budgeting in my head. I don't put anything on paper because for me, putting something on paper is kind of sacred. And if I say, oh, we're only going to spend this much on groceries or a mortgage or entertainment or whatever, then it kind of becomes so concrete that it can be kind of restricting. And that's just my own kind of mental gymnastics that's, that you can see going on there. How do you help people do budgeting in a healthy way that doesn't get them stuck in this scarcity mindset loop of self-control and, and limitation? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So I always use the analogy of a a diet, you know, diet and budget are sort of um, the same side or, you know, di different side of the same coin, I guess is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So a diet, you know, is very restrictive. I can't eat this. I can't eat that. Um, and I, you know, have to weigh my food and I have to count my calories and all this stuff. And if you told me I had to weigh my food and count my calories, I would say a few choice words to you and say, it's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. not going to ever weigh my food and, and, and watch my calories. However, I am going to eat healthy because I know it's good for my body. Mm. I know that it's good to, um, you know, eat well and, you know, put good food in my mouth. Um, do I cheat? Absolutely. You know, I'm a chocoholic. So there you go. You know, it's just, that's just part of life. That's this enjoyment of life. So if I'm going to tell you to watch this super tight budget, you know, you probably will bulk, you know, you're like, no, I'm not going to want, you know, have this super strict budget. So I prefer the term spending tracker. So, mm -hmm. um, de depending upon where they're at in their situation, if they're just coming out of a divorce or, or widowhood and, and, you know, budgets are super tight or money is very tight. We then look at, and we have to unpack that, you know, where, where they are spending. And like we mentioned earlier, the emotional spending, because that awareness to start with helps us to identify where we can improve. So um, yes, we do need to look at our money coming and going. And we do have to identify like, gosh, am I spending, you know, a thousand dollars a month on eating out? That's the mm -hmm. problem. You know, mm -hmm. and I've had, actually had that. I had one family who had that and were shocked when we uncovered it. And, um, you know, if you're trying to pay down credit card debt, if you're trying to, you know, build up a savings account and you're spending $1,000 a month on eating out, you know, we've got to make some changes, right? Mm -hmm. So there is some to that spending tracker that is, is, is um, a mindfulness to make those 
changes. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is a necessary evil to to watch that. So I always tell people, go back to two or three months and look at your credit card statements, look at your bank statements. So if you use a debit card or credit card for all of your stuff um, and look at what's what's going out, just be aware, just kind of highlight what's happening. And um, I, I suggest use a different color highlighter for each, you know, um, topic. So if you're looking at eating out, do it in yellow. If you're looking at just buying groceries, do it in green or whatever it is you want to do so that you can visually just go, oh, wow, I've got a lot of yellow on these two statements here and I've got a problem. Or, um, you know, if you, if you bought clothes or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, um, it just helps you identify that. Now, moving forward, it doesn't mean that you've got to sit there and look at every single penny you're, you're spending, but it helps you create that mindfulness and that awareness of, okay, is this something that's really going to help my long-term goal of getting out of debt or building up my savings account or setting up myself for retirement or paying for my kid's college or whatever it is that you have? Um, it makes you just sort of stop and think and like, you know, do I need this? No, not really. I can probably just pass on this for now. Um, my lifestyle is more important. My family is more important. My retirement's more important than, you know, this particular thing that I'm going to purchase. So it's again, that mindfulness. And that's where we start with kind of unfolding some of that. It's interesting that you say that because I, I do something similar where I have a spreadsheet on my computer and every other week or so I'll pull up my you know digital statement and I'll have them side by side and I'll actually type out everything from my statement into the spreadsheet, but put the money in a different column. So I have like household expenses, groceries, travel, um, personal must-haves like you know, my yoga membership or whatever the case may be, and then extra spending. And then it's all tallied up at the bottom of the column and all of those things are tallied up on the side. And so I can see where the numbers are fluctuating from month to month. And you're right. It's a huge awareness exercise. You also catch those things of, oh, I don't need this subscription anymore. Or, oh, I don't think that company was supposed to charge me for that. Or, hey, I was supposed to get a refund for that. And I didn't, you know, you catch all of those things. So it makes you mm -hmm. much more aware but I'm I'm wondering with the spending tracker and, and let's say using the example of the um, family that didn't realize they were spending a thousand dollars a month on dining out, how do you help them go from awareness into behavior change without that feeling of, you know, if they're standing in the kitchen and they're going, hey, let's go out to dinner tonight, and then mom goes, no, we can't go out to dinner. We've been spending too much. You know, how do you get them into more healthy behaviors without that kind of like restrictive, oh, we can't have, we can't have that some people really grown up with. And that becomes part of that unhealthy money story. Right. So if it's a married couple, like you just described, they both have to be on the same page mm -hmm. and they both have to have that, that why, that why is their leverage. So if their why is, you know what, we want to take a, you know, a month long trip to Europe mm -hmm. and, and not doing this is going to allow us to do that. Or we really want to put our kids, sons, kids, whatever, through a college um, of their choice. And this is going to prevent us from doing that. Or if we want to retire at a certain age and we have to have a certain dollar amount or a certain cash flow to do that and having that why sort of go, helps you to go, you know, you're right. Let's just skip out on this. This is more important for us to just stay focused on this long-term goal. And, you know, thank you for course correcting. Um, but having said that, it's not like you've got to eliminate dining out. You okay. just have to watch you know, the amount given your current situation. If you're in a bunch of credit card debt and you're trying to get out of it, then you've got to be, you know, you will go through a season of super strict, you know, maybe not dining out at all because you've mm -hmm. got to get out of that credit card debt. So it depends on your, you know, obviously individual situation. But um, if if you are that, you know, married couple, you've really got to be on the same page. And if you're single, um, you just have to, again, look at that why and just use that as, as a reminder that, no, you know what, this is really more important for, for, for me to, you know, be able to retire at this age or put my grandkid through call, whatever it is that you have. Yeah. I like that attitude because the human brain, like just our, our very nature, we like to be more additive than subtractive. So mm -hmm. if you can shift it away from instead of, oh, I don't get to go out to dinner instead it's, oh, I get to put my kid through school or, oh, I get to go to Europe or I get to retire early because I'm contributing to this plan by making this decision. Then you're, you're adding. And it kind of reminds me of the marshmallow experiment. It's like the delayed gratification where they put kids in a room 
and they put a marshmallow in front of him and they said, Hey, if you don't eat that marshmallow until I get back, I'll actually give you two marshmallows. And they tracked these kids over time and found that the kids who could delay gratification by resisting eating the one marshmallow and instead get the two, they were more successful. They were more um, self-aware. They had much better frontal lobe development made, you know, all of these great life moves compared to the group that needed to have the instant gratification of having the marshmallow right then and there. And so it's, it's not just that, oh, not going out to dinner tonight means I'm contributing more to that trip to Europe, but it's also a lifestyle shift where you're making longer term decisions that are better for you and your children, as opposed to satisfying the needs in the exact moment. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's a great analogy. And I think that that instant gratification is such a, you know, in today's society, especially is such a challenge. And I've seen that in, um, I, I do some speaking and I've done some speaking in the past um, at some schools and working with, you know, young teens and, and college kids. And, and it's, it's hard because there's so much of competition in society, you know, having the latest little gadget, having the car, having the, the clothes, the shoes, you know, whatever it is. And it's that instant gratification versus waiting um, and, and, you know, having that delayed, um, you know, experience and, and it's, it's hard. It definitely, I mean, there's adults who are struggling with this as well. I mean, just, it is, it is a, a challenge in today's society. We're yeah. all just, you know, running at, at, at warp speed. Um, and I think a lot of that too becomes a situation where, because we're working so hard and we're, you know, there's a lot of grind and hustle mentality and there's a mm -hmm. lot of just just go, go, go. We're like, you know what? We deserve to have this. We deserve to have a break and we deserve to go out to dinner and we deserve to have the nice car. Or deserve. And yes, we do, but at the expense of what? Right. Again, that's sort of like, okay, yes, you do just have this wonderful life, but do you want to retire at 55 versus 70? Do you want to, um, you know, all like I mean, mentioned all these things. And so again, it's just looking at that why, and it's, it's doing it for yourself and for your family, not trying to please or impress you know, the neighbors of the world, right? It's, it's really about focusing on what it is that we want as a family. Right. Yeah. It's that, that opportunity cost. What yeah. opportunity in the future are you giving up by getting this one thing right now? Right. Yeah. Right. And it's funny that we're talking about instant versus delayed gratification, because I kind of look at the investing world as a similar sort mm -hmm. of um, framework, because there's like the very, I call it very high risk, high intensity, like the adrenaline rush of things like day trading or Bitcoin and, you know, getting into those like really kind of flashy forms of investing. But there are forms of investing that are the delayed gratification. You're going to get access to them in 15, 20, 30 years, whatever the case may be on what you set up. And so there's so many options in the investing world as well. Where right. do you recommend that women start out if they know nothing about investing and they just want to feel like they're contributing to a future? Something. Yeah, no, that's great. Great question. So um, I always say start with um, some great books and mm -hmm gain, gain knowledge, um, try to stay offline because there's a lot of noise online mm. and you can go down so many different rabbit holes and there's, you know, YouTube videos everywhere and some are great and some are not, you don't know what's, you know, what's truth and what's not truth. So find somebody that you trust and that you like, um, that can possibly mentor you or help you teach you. Uh, that's part of what I do as a coach. Um, if there's a financial advisor that you know, and I always recommend when you're looking for a financial advisor, talk to somebody that you trust. And, and if they have an advisor that they like start there, um, and see if they have a conversation, if they can, you know, block out an hour of their day and have a conversation with you and, and kind of get you on, on track. Um, but it starts with understanding investing basics, you know, understand what a mutual fund is and what an ETF is and what an index fund is and understand the expense ratios. And cause you're paying more if you're, if your expense ratios are high, um, and being diversified and how should your assets be allocated, you know, depending upon your cash needs and your cash flow and your age and your risk tolerance, all these factors go into how you should invest. So some of those conversations should happen with somebody ideally who knows what they're doing yeah. and can walk you through that conversation. Um, but start with getting empowered, you know, take the knowledge, just start by learning and don't be in a rush to do anything. Don't be, if you're in a situation where someone's trying to push a product on you or sell you a product and you feel rushed and kind of flustered, you just walk away. You just yes. walk away. And I've always said, I've had the, I did a social post on this recently. If you cannot, 
um, turn around and explain the product that you want to purchase to a fourth grader with full understanding, you are not in a position to buy it at this point anyways, until you understand it better. Especially when it comes to insurance products and annuity products, there's so many moving parts and there's so many nuances to them that um, you've got to understand that completely before you purchase it. And um, that goes for the same for anything else that you're buying, you know, mutual funds or anything else. Um, and then just just take take your time, you know, but don't take too much time. If you've got a large sum of money sitting in a checking account earning nothing, that's lost opportunity. You're losing right. money to inflation, right? So you've got to do something, but park it in a money market account, which mm -hmm. is earning right now in the mid fours to fives. So, um, you know, at least park it somewhere where it's earning something versus nothing in a checking account. Um, but again, you know, have conversations, find someone that you trust, someone that you like, that you can learn from. Um, don't feel, you know, in a hurry, don't be in a hurry. Um, and then just take your time understanding the, the, the process. Yeah. And, and I think this really speaks to what we were saying at the beginning of the episode where you can't expect yourself to know everything. And so this is where it's really, really important to get help from someone who is an expert in these things. And I'll say, you know, to your point about hiring a financial advisor, when we were first shopping for a financial advisor, we came upon people who they said they were financial advisors, but then all they wanted to do was help us buy a life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And that felt so icky because we were like, wait, I, I mean, I don't know that much about the investing world and long-term financial planning and all of that, but I know there has to be more than a life insurance policy. So why is yeah. that the only thing you're presenting me? And we shopped around, you know, we talked to a handful of people and we eventually landed on um, Gabe Nelson, who he's been on our podcast previously, and he's still our financial advisor today. And he was fantastic because he, all he cared about was us understanding where we wanted to go, him understanding where we wanted to go and him making recommendations, which surprise had nothing to do with us buying a life insurance policy. And he really helped us feel equipped to get to those long-term goals. And he helped us, he answered so many questions before we ever even signed anything or paid him a dollar for his advice, which showed me that he was very genuine in what he was offering, which is real advice. And so for anybody who's ready to start doing that, that shopping process, be aware there are those people out there who are just the product sellers and that's not always what you need. So find that yeah. person who's going to look out for your best interest. And I'm sure you have some recommendations too, that you could point people towards good financial Absolutely. advisors. Yes. I have uh, advisors uh, for sure. And depending upon their needs, I can refer them. So yes, feel free. And you mentioned the, the product. Um, those are typically commission-based yeah. and usually high commission-based, which is why some of those individuals, you know, sell those. Um, my, my firm, my, my prior firm, we didn't sell you know, uh, product. We were a fee-based firm and I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. And the, the fee is based on the assets that they manage. They use the term AUM. So they will charge you simply a percentage based on how much they are managing and they're not going to sell you a particular product. So um, that's another great question to ask the advisors. Like, how are you earning money? How are you charging me? What is the fees? What's that look like? Um, and get a, you know, really good understanding of, of that whole picture. Exactly. Yeah. That's how ours works too, which is a relief because then as you see your, well, actually I see it the other way around. I see what he's charging us going down, which means what he's managing for us actually goes up because then he's getting that percentage of what we're growing in, in the wealth that he's managing for us. So yeah, it's, it's, an, there's a lot of different ways out there that people are going to unfortunately try to make a buck off of your lack of knowledge. So it's really yeah. important to talk to somebody who can coach you through that process. So if people wanted yeah. to find you and learn more about you and potentially work with you, where can they check you out, Patty? Yeah, the great place is uh, my website. It's just pattyhandy.com and it's Patty with a I and handy with a Y. And uh, there's a couple different ways you can work with me. That's all on the website. And I encourage um you know, if you want to book a call with me, that's, I offer a free discovery call where we just sit and have a conversation. I learn more about what's going on in your world and uh, determine if it's a good fit. And if not, I can refer you to an advisor. Um, I have referrals to state planning attorneys and, and uh, you know, all kinds of attorneys and insurance, CPAs, the whole nine yards. So um, I'm happy to assist where I can. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And we will put all of those links in the show notes. Great. Thank you, Ray.
Thanks, Fabi. Hey, Ray here again. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please subscribe and rate us in your favorite podcasting platform. Want to be a guest on the show or know someone who has an amazing story of entrepreneurship? Apply on our website at chironconsulting.us forward slash podcast.